The robbery of Ori Stevenson is just one example of a robbery and extortion that Detective Taylor participated in before he joined the GTTF. But the evidence will show that for him, for Taylor, it started even earlier than that. In 2014, almost two years before he joined the Gun Trace Task Force, even before he joined the SES unit that Jenkins led, former Detective Maurice Ward will testify that he began robbing civilians with Defendant Taylor as early as January of 2014. He will testify that when he and Taylor served on a drug squad together, they went into a house where a man named Sean Whiting lived. Sean Whiting sold drugs. He will take the stand and tell you that. In the course of that search warrant, money was found, and Ward will admit to you that he stole $3,000 of that money and shared it with Taylor. Now in the case of Detective Herschel, you will also hear evidence of him robbing and extorting civilians before he too joined the Gun Trace Task Force. For example, you will hear testimony from two victims, Herbert Tate and Antonio Santifo, that Detective Herschel robbed on back-to-back -back days in November of 2015. He robbed Herbert Tate on November the 27th of 2015, and he robbed Antonio Santifo on November 28th, 2015, the very next day. Now, as I said, this isn't a case about overzealous policing or police tactics. It's not even a case about policing at all. It's a case about greed. And because it's not a case about policing, you're not going to be asked to decide whether these men made good arrest or bad arrest. They're not charged with making bad arrests. They're charged with taking money from people they had detained and with defrauding the Baltimore Police Department and taxpayers here in Maryland. And the fact that some of the arrests they made were good or may have been good isn't a defense. Just like it's not a defense in a bank robbery case to talk about all the times a defendant went into a bank and didn't rob it. In the course of this trial, you will learn that in addition to, and in some cases at the same time as whatever legitimate police work they were doing, they also robbed and extorted people and committed overtime fraud. And these two things, legitimate police work and criminal conduct, can and did occur side by side in this case on more than one occasion. You will hear testimony that the defendants and their co-defendants went out most nights and looked for guns. And they seized guns when they found them. And their success as a unit was measured by the number of gun arrests they made. And while they were out on the street stopping people, looking for guns, sometimes for good reason, but you will hear testimony sometimes for no reason at all, or going into houses, sometimes with a search warrant, but you will hear testimony sometimes without a search warrant, and if they had the opportunity and found money, they took it. The robberies and extortions in this case for the most part were, like nearly all crimes, crimes of opportunity. The United States doesn't have to prove that the defendant's only purpose in stopping someone or going into a house was to steal money from them. That's not what the law requires. The evidence will show that these defendants and the other members of the Gun Trace Task Force had both purposes, to seize guns in the exercise of their powers as law enforcement and using or abusing those same powers to steal money. They were, simply put, both cops and robbers at the same time. But you will learn even their seizure, seizures of guns, or their motivations for seizures of those guns, was tainted by criminal intent. They were motivated to seize guns and make gun arrests because then they could claim to have worked overtime. And the evidence will show, however, that they didn't work all the overtime they claimed. The evidence will also show that they didn't even work the number of hours in their regular shifts that they claimed. In sum, you will hear evidence that these two defendants and their co-defendants engaged in an organized overtime fraud scheme. You will hear testimony that while they were supposed to work often from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., they rarely came in on time. More commonly, they would arrive hours later than their 8 o'clock start, sometimes even after 4 p.m., in other words, after the end of their regular shift. So why would they come in if their shift had ended? Or why would they work past their shift? because if they worked past the end of the shift, they could earn more money in overtime. And if they got a gun, their sergeant, Jenkins, would let them claim to have worked more in overtime than they actually did. You'll hear examples like if they got a gun at midnight, they could put in an overtime slip that said they worked until 2 a.m. or 5 a.m. or 7 a.m., hours after they had actually worked. And you will hear testimony that if some part of the GTTF made a gun arrest, two of the members or three of the members, then the whole unit put in overtime slips as if they had all worked even if the other members had, even if on some occasion the other members were on vacation. 
Simply put, guns equaled phony overtime, and all the defendants, these two defendants and their co-defendants, knew it was wrong. They all falsified overtime slips for themselves and for one another. And if anyone at the Baltimore Police Department questioned why they were working so much overtime, they pointed to the number of gun arrests they were making to justify it. Now I'd like to give you an overview of the charges in this case. Count one. Count one charges racketeering conspiracy. Count two charges racketeering. Counts three and five charge Hobbs Act robbery and extortion. And counts four and six charge possession of a firearm in furtherance of a crime of violence. Now as Her Honor has instructed you, a conspiracy is an agreement among two or more persons to achieve an unlawful objective. In this case, to violate the federal law against racketeering. That law, sometimes referred to as RICO, says that it shall be unlawful for any person employed by or associated with any enterprise engaged in or the activities which affect interstate or foreign commerce to conduct or participate directly or indirectly in the conduct of such enterprises affairs through a pattern of racketeering activity. And I'd like to touch on a number of those concepts briefly. An enterprise includes any legal entity, such as a government agency, a partnership, or a corporation. So an enterprise under the RICO statute is not just illegal organizations like the mob. The enterprise in this case is the Baltimore Police Department. The Baltimore Police Department is a state agency of the state of Maryland, created by state statute, and the employee. The defendants were employees of that state agency and the Baltimore Police Department affected interstate commerce, as you will hear from a witness, because it did things like buy guns and automobiles and other things that were made or manufactured outside the state of Maryland. But the essence of this charge is that the defendants were able to abuse their positions as employees of the enterprise, as employees of the Baltimore Police Department, to commit crimes, and that is what the RICO statute targets. Now the evidence will show that the defendants engaged in a pattern of racketeering activities, and that's what the government is required to prove. And that pattern, as Her Honor has instructed you, includes violation both of state and federal law. The RICO law covers both violations of state and federal law. In this case, Maryland state law against conspiracy, robbery, and extortion is charged, and federal law against wire fraud is charged. Now, as I said, and Her Honor instructed you, conspiracy is a criminal agreement, and a conspiracy, like a business or any other organization, has members who play different roles and engage in different activities, as you will hear about in the course of this trial. Sometimes the members of a conspiracy work together. Sometimes they work separately. And that is what makes conspiracy so dangerous. And the evidence of a conspiracy comes not in the form of some contract they all signed or a meeting where they all got together and said, this is what we're going to do, and this is when we're going to do it. Evidence of a conspiracy, which is a criminal agreement, characterized by secrecy, comes in the form of both words and deeds. So for example, you will hear testimony from former Detective Rayum that during a search warrant in June of 2016, he and defendant Herschel agreed that if either one of them found money, they would steal it and share it. And later, in July of 2016, when they were in the Hamilton's home in Westminster, Rayum found money along with Herschel and Gondo, and Rayum stole it, and he shared it with Herschel and Gondo and Jenkins. Now there will be specific what are referred to as racketeering acts that you will see evidence in support of. And these racketeering acts are specific robberies and extortions and wires, interstate wires to the payroll company that managed the Baltimore Police Department's payroll system. And the defendants are charged first in multiple racketeering acts with committing robbery in violation of the laws of the state of Maryland. And robbery is the taking and carrying away of property from someone else or someone's presence and control by force or threat of force with the intent to deprive the victim of the property. The evidence will show that these defendants and their co-defendants took property from people they detained, both money and drugs and personal property. They took them from their pockets, the detainees' pockets. They took them from their cars and from their houses. And the defendants and their co-defendants were armed they were armed with their Baltimore Police Department service weapons, and the people they were stopping and detaining knew that. And the defendants and their co-defendants used force to stop and search and take this property from the people they detained. The defendants and their co-defendants used handcuffs to physically restrain people while they were taking their property. 
and the defendants and their co-defendants had the ability to use force and violence if someone resisted, if someone fought back. And the people they detained knew that. Now for these episodes, the defendants are also charged with multiple acts of extortion in violation of Maryland law. And under Maryland law, an officer or employee of the state, and again, the Baltimore Police Department is a state agency, may not wrongfully obtain or attempt to obtain money, property, or anything of value from a person with the person's consent. If the consent is obtained under color or pretense of office or by wrongful use of actual or threatened force, the defendants acted under color or pretense of office. They were police officers, employees of the state, given authority and power on behalf of the state to act. And the people they stopped and detained knew that. And they abused that office to take property from the people they had stopped for themselves. And as the evidence will show, they also used force and threatened force to obtain property from the detainees. Now, as I said, the defendants are also charged with wire fraud and multiple racketeering acts allege violations of wire fraud. And the federal law prohibits interstate wires using interstate wires to commit fraud. The fraud in this case was that the defendants claimed to work more overtime than they actually did. And Baltimore Police Department uses a sort of old school system of physical overtime slips filled out by these defendants, sometimes themselves, sometimes on behalf of one another in the course of this organized scheme. And on the overtime slip, these defendants and their co-defendants had to certify. Certify not only that they worked their regular shift, which the evidence will show they often didn't, but also that they worked the number of hours of overtime they claimed for the reasons they gave. At the heart of any fraud, ladies and gentlemen, is a lie. And the lie in this case was that they had worked these hours when they didn't. These overtime slips, as you'll hear from a witness, were then loaded into a software run by the payroll company, ADP, and that software company, that software generated interstate wires. And you will hear from a witness from ADP that will tell you all the data in the ADP system is managed out of two data centers outside of Maryland. Now these specific episodes and other evidence will show that the acts of racketeering that are charged in this case are related to one another and pose, pose at the time a threat of continued criminal activity. They are related, the evidence will show, because they had similar purposes. To obtain money and property, results, the defendants were successful participants, and you will hear about how they worked together as a unit to commit these crimes and methods. Stopping civilians on the street, abusing the authority that they had when they had it to go into a house to conduct a search warrant. In other words, these robberies and extortions and fraud are not isolated events, but part of a pattern, a pattern of racketeering activity. And you will hear testimony about how the defendants posed a threat of continued criminal activity until they were arrested. You will hear testimony that in the months before they were charged, their former sergeant, Wayne Jenkins, proposed two more robberies. And these robberies fit the pattern they had established perfectly. Jenkins proposed targeting two large-scale drug dealers because where there are drugs, there's money. Taylor was present for both of these proposals and Herschel, who by this time had been reassigned out of the gun trace task force to a shooting squad, came back from the shooting squad to hear the second proposal in the woods with the other members of the conspiracy. Now counts three and five charge the Hobbs Act. And the Hobbs Act says, whoever in any way or degree obstructs, delays, or affects commerce or the movement of an article or commodity in commerce by robbery or extortion or attempts or conspires to do so, or commits or threatens physical violence to any person or property in furtherance of a plan or purpose to do anything in violation of this section commits a crime. The Hobbs Act is a federal law that prohibits robbery and extortion. So in this case, in the racketeering counts, you will be instructed on Maryland law against robbery and extortion. And in the Hobbs Act counts about federal law against robbery and extortion. In counts four and six, as her honor has instructed you, charged that the defendants possessed a firearm in furtherance of a crime of violence. Under federal law, it is an additional offense to possess a firearm. In this case, the BPD service weapons they had been issued in furtherance of a crime of violence, which is the violation of the Hobbs Act. Now, as you can see, these sets of counts work together. So count three charges defendant Taylor for the March 22, 2016 robbery and extortion of Arie Stevenson where more than $200,000 was taken. 
and then count four charges him and his co-defendants with possession of a firearm and furtherance of that crime. Similarly, count five charges defendant Herschel with the robbery of Ronald Hamilton that occurred in July of 2016, where more than, where $20,000 was taken. And count six charges defendant Herschel for possessing a firearm in furtherance of that crime of violence. Now I made reference and I've talked about a number of the witnesses you will hear from, the testimony you will hear in this case. But the evidence is not limited to testimony, although testimony in any case is crucially important. You will also hear recorded telephone calls from a wiretap on Gondo's phone, and you will hear microphone recordings from a microphone that was put in the Baltimore Police Department car that was operated by Gondo without his knowledge. And you will also see documents and photographs and physical evidence.